Kristen Charney has puppeteered for television, movies, and in commercials. She's worked for The Muppets, Cartoon Network, Netflix, and more. She played the title role in the Jim Henson Company production Francis, and she's also performed live puppetry in several theatrical productions. I talked to Kristen Charney about her career on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Kristen Charney, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank you, Grant. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to have you here. Um, <laughs> we've known each other for uh, for quite some time, and yes. um, I'm always inspired when I talk to you, and I... I, I do believe you are somebody who, you know, really just you, you're very supportive puppeteer to other puppeteers. And I'm excited to talk to you about Aww. your career and um, also probably get some advice for other people about uh, about puppetry because you're so good with it. Oh, great. Thanks. I'm pleased that that's my the impression I give. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always like to start by asking, do you remember your first exposure to puppetry, the first time you saw puppets? Probably the first time I saw puppets was when I was really little. Um, my mother, I'm one of four girls uh, and a brother, and she would take us to FAO Schwartz and they would do puppet shows and we'd go to Saks Fifth Avenue for you know the Christmas brunch. And there were always marionettes. So I always was infatuated with string puppets because that was, those were my first puppets. And then, you know, later on, of course, Sesame Street, that was the TV thing. But live puppetry as a really little kid was the thing. Yeah, mostly marionettes. Yeah, that's what they had. And I was given a lot of, at the time, Pelham puppets were a big thing. And so I had, to this day, I have this crazy collection of Pelham puppets. And, well, a little inner secret. I'm, I'm a super, I was just this really super meticulous kid. And so I had to put them back in the box with the tissue paper, just so they still have the original <laughs> tissue paper in the box. Wow. And my yeah. siblings, I wouldn't let them touch them <laughs> because they would tangle them and not put them correctly back in the box. <laughs> so yeah. So those were a big thing. Were, were, I mean, you know, I know you saw these puppets when you were younger. Was there any idea of like, oh, I could do this as a job, like when you were a kid? Or was it just something you love, you liked playing with? Uh, for me, well, you know, I did shows for my friends and my, because my mom also bought me a stage for all those puppets. So naturally I had to do shows. <laughs> they had, <laughs> I made backdrops and there were backdrops in it. But I never, I never really thought of it like a job. It was just me entertaining people. I always liked to make people laugh. So that was that. And then when Sesame Street, sort of, I was conscious of Sesame Street, it was, I loved Cookie Monster. There was just this sort of sloppy joy to him that was, uh, you know, he was all over the place and wild with that crazy energy. And yeah, so that was my TV puppet. And watching Sesame Street, I always thought, for some reason, I never saw myself as the puppeteer. I thought I was going to be the person on the street w with the puppets, like the sidekick to the puppets. Mm -hmm. That's how I saw myself. I don't, so puppeteer as a profession, no, I never saw that coming. <laughs> was, yeah. there, was there an idea of being a performer? Like, you know, because you, you're talking about being the other person on the street. Like, mm -hmm. did you want to put on shows and, and that kind of thing? I mean, you did put on shows, but you know what I'm saying? Like, did, is that what you saw yourself doing in the future? Oh, from when I was pretty young, yeah. I was going to be an actor. I wanted to be in shows. And I was, you know, we went to the theater and music was such a big part of everything. And my family, strangely enough, I think there's probably two people who are actually tone deaf. And it's, <laughs> that's a rare thing, but when they sing out loud, it, your ears bleed. So it, the music thing was really my world. I played piano and my, my parents were great at supporting my pursuit of music and the crafts were crazy in my house because I was always making something. 
always, always making things. So crafts were a big part of it. But I always saw myself as an actor. I was going to be, I was going to be a performer. And I'd stay up crazy late at night with my mom and we'd watch movie musicals. So I knew all the music to all the classic musicals and yeah, that stuff was where I saw myself. Yeah. So that was my beginning. Yeah. Were your, you said your parents were supportive of you. Were your parents creative at all? Were they working in creative professions or have creative pursuits? Well, my mother was a fashion designer. So she had a, her, she created her own business where she designed all these clothes. And it was at the time when a lot of people made their own clothes. So she created these kits where people could buy the kit and sew their own clothes. And my dad was a salesman. He was an insurance salesman. So yes and no, because there was creativity on my mom's side. She had a a cabinet filled with art equipment and you had to get permission to go in there. <laughs> Nobody, because, you know, with five kids, it'd be a mess. And so there were certain things she would only let me use because she knew I'd put it back <laughs> ridiculously. <laughs> so yes and no. My dad had a workshop, but he built shelves and furniture, things like that on the side. Yeah. Um, but they, they loved the arts and we'd go to the theater. They loved the arts, but they were not artists themselves necessarily. My mom drew, drew, she taught me how to draw. And we had any, anytime I said, I want to make something, she was the first one to go. I'd have a kit of all of that equipment to make whatever it was I was going to make. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's great to have be that yeah. supportive. And I, I think I would even say fashion design and building furniture could be artistic jobs, you know, um, Who there's knew? artistic elements yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Now I would die for my father's tools. I didn't know at the time. You know, when you when you got into school and and you know maybe high school and and college and stuff, were you performing in shows? Is that what you were trying to focus on, or, or did you have yes. other pursuits? Yeah. No, pretty nonstop. Ever since um, probably junior high, I did theater. And when I was when my mom had her um, fashion company, I modeled for her as a kid. So I was a kid model. And then, you know, my friends would see my picture in a magazine. <laughs> and, uh, and then I did in high school, I discovered Lily Tomlin. And I would do actually maybe it was middle school, but I would I would do all of Lily Tomlin's characters, but I would dress up like them. My father once built me a giant <laughs> rocking chair so I could be Edith Ann. Yeah. That was a big thing. And it, the comedy of it, people would fall on the floor laughing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And so, you know, as a kid, that was really satisfying. But there's kind of a little a bitter thing. I was in college and um, they were doing some big variety show and they they needed something. I did musical numbers because I sang. I always was singing. So I did musical numbers. And then they needed something that was non-musical. And they asked me, did I have any comic stuff? So I did the Lily Tomlin thing. I did, um, I did a couple of her characters. And people were crying, laughing. And the director of the theater department came up to me and said, Chris, I have to tell you, I had no idea you had that kind of comic timing. And my heart sank because I felt like I had been doing this since I was 13 years old. And that's the best I can do after, you know, going through this theater program, being a serious actor. And I was, I was at the time, I was super daunted to hear that, that that was, you know, he had no idea I had that kind of talent. And I thought, well, this is just, a, I'm a fraud. It's not my material. It's not my timing. It's something I've been doing since I'm a child. And I was devastated that I had never gotten any better than that. And, you know, in hindsight, people tell me that's not, you know, not anybody can do that, you know, but it was like one of those, you know, it was a growing thing for me. And it's also looking back at that, I think there are things that we are naturally thrown to do, you know, and we can't discredit those things as not being valuable because you do it naturally. 
Yeah. And, you know, so I think there's value in that. Yeah. You know, even when you do something um, naturally, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's actually a gift. So right. I think I was the same way in high school. I was repeating, I loved comedy and I was just repeating you know, acts that I'd see on TV and I go to school the next day. And, and, you know, I remember I had one stand up tape that was just a bunch of different comedians and I would go recite those as much as I could, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think even doing that gives you a good basis. It's not like you're going to record an album with Lily Tomlin's bits on them, um, right. you know, but it like, it really gives you, you, you find the person who resonates with you. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I almost see it like a, a mentor who's not there. You know, Lily Tomlin was your mentor for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, even though she wasn't there personally. Yeah. I did get to meet her later. That, I, I was going to ask, did you get a yeah, chance to meet her? I yeah. did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And she was lovely. Well, yeah. um, when you got out of college, what was your career path? Like, where did you go? What, what did you think you were doing? I, um, I came to LA to visit and then I went to Manhattan and, you know, I grew up in Connecticut, so I was in and out of New York pretty much most of my life. And um, I kind of decided that if I really wanted to be a serious actor, I had to go to New York. So I moved to New York. I did the whole, you know, pounding the pavement, auditioning all over the place, uh, taking class. I studied acting in New York. And it's so funny because a lot of acting schools, they don't care about you're having studied in college, it doesn't count. It's not legitimate. So, because <laughs> uh, I didn't go to a theater school. Yeah. Yeah. So I lived in New York for a long time and I did a lot of theater for free. And then I started seriously auditioning for musical. If you sing, you just have a lot more auditions than you do if you only do plays. And so I started getting work. So, you know, I go and do a play somewhere or do a, a musical somewhere. I did a, you know, bus and truck tour and I did a couple of tours and I met some of my best friends in the world doing that. I did the New York thing and then I decided to move uh, of some friends and I uh, talked about maybe going to LA for a little bit. I had a great apartment in Manhattan, which was really tough to get. So I sublet my apartment and I gave myself two years to move to LA and see what would happen. My career kind of plateaued a little bit because I am, I am not an LA type. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the thing is that I had no film credits. I was in the Screen Actors Guild because of some work I had. I mean, I did soap operas and commercials in New York, but it wasn't, it's not a film town. It's a theater town. Yeah. So coming here, I felt like my credits were kind of useless, but I still, you know, I auditioned for commercials and, and then I thought the weird catalyst was that I had an apartment and I, what I did was I transferred my job from a, I worked in a hotel in New York because every actor is a waiter also. So I transferred my job. It was a big hotel chain. I will keep it nameless. <laughs> and, um, I got fired here over some parking incident and I had worked with the company for five and a half years and I got fired in LA and I thought, Oh, well, this is crap. I'm going back to New York. So I still had six months on my lease. So I decided for that six months, I was going to do something I really loved and not worry about it. And so I made a list of things that I loved and puppets was on it. And so I decided I was going to read books for the Screen Actors Guild because they had a, a reading to kids program at the time. And I worked with kids a lot and I, I liked, you know, doing that. And I like, I'm good at lip sync. I was always good at lip sync. So I thought I'll have a puppet with me because for me, as a, I, I did some teaching as a teaching artist uh, later in life. But the thing is, I, I like having a puppet um, to sort of be the bad kid in the room. And it keeps the kids in order because they're now they're a fly on the wall watching the bad kid rather than being the bad kid. <laughs> right. I wanted to build a puppet. So I went to Bob Baker Marionette Theater because I looked in, you know, in the phone book and that's what I found. So I went down there and they gave me, they said, well, we don't do these kinds of puppets like a hand puppet because that's what I wanted. So they gave me Michael Earl's name. 
and his phone number and said, call him, he can probably help you. And so there a few things happened. I, well, so the Michael Earl thing was I called him up and I, I, you know, in case your listeners don't know him, he has passed at this point. He's, he was a brilliant puppeteer and so generous. And he, he gave me a shopping list and it had, you know, foam and staples and contact cement. And he said, and we made a date and I was to come to his apartment. Well, my roommate was a guy and he said, how do you know this guy isn't an ax murderer? You can't. I said, ax murderers don't give you a shopping list. <laughs> Well, if they're crazy psychos, yeah. yes, right. go buy an axe and uh, <laughs> some trash bags. You like you do. <laughs> right. So I went shopping and I got some flat foam for patterning and I showed up at his house with all this stuff and he sat on the floor of his apartment with me. He showed me his puppets and he basically showed me how to make a puppet head. And so then, you know, I went home and I did that and then I brought it back to him and he was like, huh this isn't bad. I want to introduce you to my friend. So he introduced me to Lisa Sturs, who had a shop in Laurel Canyon. And she looked at my puppet and he said, oh, Michael was teaching a class, an on-camera class in her basement. So he invited me to come to that class and he knew I was a theater person. So after a couple of classes, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, Kristen, if you really want to do this, you could have a career doing this because he, because I was a dancer for a long time, you know, music and dance. He said, you know how to move the body. So that's, he said, dancers make good puppeteers. I'm like, I'm not really a dancer. I'm a hack. And he said, it's enough. So if you really want to do it, you can commit yourself and do this. And Lisa looked at my puppet head and she goes, oh, do you want to work in my shop? I'm building this show. And I said, mm, okay. So here I had lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> I've made puppets on the floor of this guy's apartment. And Lisa, I mean, I always joke and say that job was whittling puppets in the woods for lunch money because <laughs> Lisa would hire a lot of willing but unskilled people um, for her main. And she would teach those of us that she thought you know, could do something, um, she would teach and then she'd have a few ringers come in to sort of save us from ourselves. And that was Christine Papalexis and Greg Ballora. And, oh, I also met Peter Baird there. Um, he, another one who's gone, but um, I met a lot of people because of this, the connections just kept happening. It was this little magical progression of connections. And I learned how to make a basic puppet and how to use some of the tools. Greg taught me how to um, use a bandsaw, which still to this day is my favorite tool in the workshop. <laughs> and Christine and I were immediate friends. She had come back from working in Romania. So I thought, oh, she's exotic. She worked in <laughs> Romania. And um, so from there, it was just, you know, a domino effect of meeting people. And I got she said, hey, we're shooting a thing on the beach. Do you want to come? Okay. I went and I met Susan Carlson on that. Um, and that was, you know, she was a dancer and she was doing, I don't remember, but she was puppeteering on this thing. So one thing led to another and I got sort of handed down the chain of people. And then um, somewhere in there, I wrote a letter to the creature shop because I thought I still want to really build this. It, oh, it was before I had built the puppet. I wanted to build, <laughs> I was desperate to learn how to build a puppet. And I had caught, I had um, found David Barrington Holt, his name and his number because he ran the creature shop at the time. And so I wrote him a letter back in the days when you wrote letters saying, um, you know, I'd love to do any, I sent him a business resume because I figured I could be a receptionist. <laughs> that was my taste. I could be a receptionist and then like in my lunch hour, run into the shop and see how they do it. <laughs> yeah. So he was so gracious and so generous. He invited me to the shop for a tour. And I asked him at one point, I asked him why he did that. And he said, I thought your letter was delightful. So he asked me to come to the shop. He gave me a tour. And at the time, 
the culture was that the builders didn't puppeteer. I don't think it's really that, it's not that way so much anymore. Some people, sure, but there's more crossover now. And he told me if I ever wanted to perform for the company, I probably shouldn't work in the shop. And I thought, oh, that's disappointing. Okay. And then he sent me to, um, he introduced me to, he gave me Michel and Sisti's number. And Misha and I now have been friends for many, many years. And I auditioned for Sesame Street Live and to do a suit. And um, I was too tall to be the frog. So I had to be the pig. I didn't get the job, but I had, I had gone to a few callbacks because I had to choreograph a number and then realized when I had the head in, there was no way I could possibly do the dance number I choreographed because uh, the head was way too heavy for my skinny little neck. So um, I just choreographed wrong. Um, anyway, but years later, DBH um, asked me to do some jobs for him. Uh, he thought I was this little person so I could do this little tiny Japanese puppet. And I, I spoke some Japanese because I had taken some classes. So he gave me a job. He told me at the time they were developing this digital system and that when it, you know, when it was, when he was able or not busy, I could come down and try it if I wanted to. And, you know, I could learn on my own time. I could come in and diddle with it. And eventually I did do that. I mean, mm -hmm. this was years after the whole making puppets in the woods thing. I would go to the creature shop and put hours into just, well, the way it used to be, Alan Troutman had written this book about the HDPS and how it worked. Just for folks who are listening, this is the Henson Digital Puppetry Studio. So they handed me this manual. It was a, a binder of how to put it, how to create a character in the software. And occasionally when I was there, Bruce Lenoyle was there and Alan would come in and I think Alice Deneen was doing it. And I was just this flunky who was in there trying to learn it. And so occasionally I would ask them questions, but it was, you know, now they have in the system, the software is that you can take sad eyes and program around that. Well, they used to not have sad eyes. There were muscles in every part of the eyebrow and muscles in every part of the eye. And you had to, you would build it yourself, the expression. Mm -hmm. So it was very, it was, you know, for a novice, it was so complicated for me. So I put in a lot of time to um, figure it out. Um, it was exciting and fun to get to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I did. That's how I initially learned. Well, I think um, it's, I think it's interesting and it's a good lesson too of, um, you know, you, you just told us the story where you met this person and you, you know, kind of worked with this person, quote unquote, worked with this person and they introduced you to this person and you kind of worked on them. And it really is in this business that I've found too, is yes, we have, there's times where there's open casting calls where they mm -hmm. they see a hundred puppeteers and they're looking for it. But a lot of times, more times than not, it's somebody gets a job on a show and they get to pick the puppeteers that they want to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times that's that's how it happens. And so getting out there and meeting people and being a good person <laughs> to be around. Well, and, this is you know. this is something when people ask me what's important, how do you move along? I think one of the hallmark qualities of getting passed on is being a kind person, having fun and doing really be interested rather than trying to be interesting all the time, listen, be a kind person and mean it. If you're really into it, do your research. It's like, I believe really strongly in educating yourself and what it is you say you want to do. And I know I studied acting and theater for years. I knew everything. I mean, I learned how to be in a set shop and how to, you know, all those things. What do the costumers do? What do the lighting people do? I had to write lot light plots, you know, when you go to school, school for that. And in puppetry, I never did that. So what I did initially, um, after I met Greg and Christine, those guys did 
you know, they would go to festivals and um, they were part of Puppeteers of America. And I thought, I have to get educated. And well, one thing, I was already in the Screen Actors Guild, but I did a lot of non-union stuff as a puppeteer. I changed, I mean, that's probably horrible to say, but I used an alias and I did puppet stuff because I didn't have the chops to compete with union people. They are really good. People who are working all the time, they're phenomenal at the sport of puppeteering, you know, and you have to be good when it's time to go. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I had no technique of going from, you know, when you work on television, you, you tape your script up and there's a technique from getting your lines on the script and watching your puppet on the monitor. There's a whole technique about, you can't just stare at the script because then you can't see what your puppet's doing, but you can't right. just stare at the puppet because then you can't read your script. So, you know, you have to learn all that stuff by doing it. So at the time, um, you know, not everything was as public as it is now, you know, so it was easier when somebody would, I mean, people all the time say, Hey, I'm doing this little project. It's not union and I don't have much money. Can you do it? And I just said yes to everything because every experience, even if it's not a great experience, it's a learning experience. Right. But the festival thing, the Hensons used to host a, an international puppetry festival in New York, and it would go on for a couple of weeks and they had puppetry uh, puppeteers and puppet companies from all over the world that would go to this thing. And I would go for a week and I would see sometimes four shows a day and run all over the city and go to Staten Island and New Jersey and wherever these play, these puppet pieces were. And I was, my brain was exploding from the amount of puppet shows, the number of puppet shows I saw, but it was such an education in what is possible. I saw Ronnie Burkett for the first time there, who is uh, an amazing uh, puppet artist. And I, I mean, a side note about him, I went, he was performing his show at The Public, which is a very prestigious theater. And I walked into the lobby and I don't know, I didn't, I looked and I found out that it was only him doing a two and a half hour marionette show, but I had never seen marionette theater at that level before. I was sitting on the edge of my seat the entire time watching him. <laughs> and, you know, there's my prejudgment going, oh, my God, I can't see this show. And it was the most exciting bit of theater. You know, yeah. he's he's brilliant. So I, I highly recommend educating yourself on as much puppetry as you possibly can, because it all all the lines blur and you use different techniques from different styles in many different. It's not just a hand puppet on your hand. Yeah. There's so much out there. And I think it's amazing. Yeah. The first time I went to the O'Neill, I think that's the first time I went where there was all these different styles. And I was just like, mm -hmm. holy cow, you can, yeah. like, I came away with a whole, like, like big pages of a notebook of just like, you mm -hmm. can do this, you can use your hand, you can use this, you know, like all this. I was, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm one who highly recommends going to festivals and seeing mm -hmm. as many of the shows as possible. And yeah. Um, you know, and uh, taking workshops, there's a, yeah. a thousand workshops out there on builders and teachers and actors and character develop. I mean, there's so much and you can find it if you really want to. Yeah. But I, I, as far as the whole thing about how do you progress your career, be interested and be a kind person. And, yeah. you know, people want to have you around when you're like that. So, <laughs> right. And, you know, we always have to remind ourselves, especially when the work gets tough, you have to remind yourself about that so yeah. that you stay positive in the moment. <laughs> Don't become that one who nobody calls anymore. Right. You don't want to be <laughs> that guy. Yeah. So what was your first paid puppet job, either union or non-union? Okay. Well, I'm going to go with my first union puppeteering job. Okay. Um, that was from Tony Urbano who will always be dear to me because he is another one. I mean, 
honestly, I am so blessed with so many people who were so generous to me at the beginning of my career. There was an audition for this. It was basically a training film to teach kids how to use 911. And I went in and auditioned and I, you know, still, it was really at the beginning of my puppet career. I hadn't really done much on camera. He looked at my resume. I think the only reason he called me was because I had Gilbert and Sullivan on my resume. <laughs> and he is a huge Gilbert and Sullivan fan. So I had done some Gilbert and Sullivan. And of course he asked me about that. And I sang an old Broadway tune when I um, auditioned and he was thrilled <laughs> because I was pushing all the right buttons. Plus he was a big, he had built, I think he built a puppet for Lily Tomlin. So here it's, you know, kind of full circle. What happens? It turned into the Lily Tomlin conversation too. So I checked all the right boxes for Tony and, um, and he was so kind to let me a uh, novice do this job. Kevin Carlson was on that and Christine Papalexis and, uh, um, Brad Abril. Do you know Brad? I don't. Brad is a, he does a lot of voiceover. He's a huge voiceover guy and he does commercials. I see him on TV all the time. He's like, you are classic American dad. And he used to do puppetry. I think he still would, but he, I think his plate is full. Um, no. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, he did sort of the um, iconic character on that show. He was Reddy Fox. And I learned a lot. And I remember um, doing hands for the first time. I had to assist Tony because Kevin was assisting him and the gloves were too small. And it was like, I can't get my hands in here. And it was, Kristen, come on, do it. You can do it. And I was like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, and I didn't know about finding the edge of frame. And it was a little, it was horrific. And uh, <laughs> well, you know, I was covered in flop sweat while I'm doing it because I didn't know what I was doing. But, um, and Tony got mad at me cause I wasn't, I would blow the shot. And then later, of course he, he was so sweet. He apologized for yelling at me cause I was ready to cry. Anyway, we got through it. Yeah. Um, but that was my first union experience and it was so exciting and so amazing. And, um, I remember Kevin's character, played basketball and that was amazing to me. And how do you do that? And, <laughs> you know, so that was my first really honestly paid job yeah. as a puppeteer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about a couple of the other uh, projects uh, that you worked on. And some of these are, um, you know, a theater project. Some of these are, are television projects, but uh, okay. um, you know, just looking over your resume that, that you sent me and I was like, Oh, I want to ask about that. I want to ask about <laughs> that. And um, you know, we talked to Leslie Carrara on the show, um, way back at the start Aww. of the podcast and uh, Leslie's awesome. And every, we, we all love Leslie, but you worked on her Wahoo wagon show at the I El did. Capitan. Yeah. So what was, how was that experience? How did you get hooked up in that? And, and what was that like? Oh my gosh. Well, Leslie is just obviously a bundle of joy. And I remember she was putting, she was um, working with Disney at the time. And we, Greg and I were in a grocery store. We ran into her in a grocery store and of course, you know, you bump into Leslie and you're there for an hour talking about whatever. <laughs> and she was bubbling over about this show she was creating. And she said, and you have to come and audition for it. And, blah, blah. and um, we kind of, okay, sure. Yeah. It was originally, there were a couple of iterations of it because it workshopped a couple of times um, in the beginning. I had gone to audition for it. And who was, it was Donna and Julianne, Greg Ballora, Michelle Spears, a bunch of people did the first workshop and Pam Arciero directed it. And that was really fun. The first time we did the show, I just remember candy, you know, Leslie, there's candy everywhere. <laughs> right. There was candy Always. at every rehearsal. When we performed at the El Capitan, my son was just he was a baby. He was like eight weeks old. And I think when we did the first workshop, um, that was when I actually ended up getting pregnant and I didn't <laughs> realize it at the time. And then, so when he was a baby and we were at the El Capitan, Alison Mork was doing it at that point too. She was in the show. I think Carla Rudy was there. I think she did. She, I've heard her talk about being part of that. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> we would do the show on Saturday mornings and it was shown, they would show a movie and we would do our stage show. And Leslie would do, you know, she did the lion's share of it. And we were these wolves in a balcony. Originally the wolves were on stage. They were these full bodies that would, um, they would do dance moves and everything too. And they were in the back of a car. And then when we were in the theater, the wolves were in the balcony and we would sing from the balcony. So we did the show and then a movie would start. And at one point I remember she was doing stink, which was this, he was a purple skunk, which is stink, right? I would, for, for a little bit, I, I would um, sing harmony as stink from the balcony. So <laughs> Leslie could harmonize with him at the end of the song, which was fun, but that was such great fun. And that was, it was just such a great time to have a relationship with Leslie. And it was so stressful for her because she was just wearing a million hats. I'm not sure what else to say about it, except it was an amazing time and such a wonderful thing to be a part of and to be a part of Leslie's creative vision was so fun. And it yeah. solidified a lot of relationships during that. We were all such good friends. It was just a joy to work on that. Yeah. Another show that was on your resume that mm. um, I had never heard of, but I looked up and I just, just from the little clip that's on YouTube, fell in love was the crayon box because uh. the puppets on it are like so unique compared to puppets on other shows. So mm. I would love to know about your experience working on that show. Um, and yeah, just your time on it. Cause it was, a I want to learn more about this show. Cause it looks really interesting. That was a really fun show to do. It was developed through Random House Books and Polygram Records. Uh, the Kyotos uh, were the artistic producer on that. They built, I'm not sure who built what, but it was the, it was the Kyotos and um, Norman Tempia built some and uh, Pat Brimer built my pig. And the pig was one of my favorite characters ever. And it had animated sections to it and live action sections. And uh, there was a lot of music involved. And that was a great show. And it was one of the shows, there were two shows that were my get out of jail cards for working in a hotel. And that was one of them. It kept me out of having to get a what I call a street job, you know, <laughs> outside of the craft, you know? Yeah. So um, we shot... I think we shot 26 episodes of that, but that was, that was a huge thing. I love doing children's shows and it was um, Donna Kimball, James Murray. I think Lenny, Len Levitt was on that. Uh, Todd Maddox was on it. Phil Barron. Do you know Phil? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, From Phil, Timmy the Tooth. We, we interviewed yeah. him on the show. Oh, okay. Phil Barron and uh, Greg. Ballora, he was the bear. I love that bear puppet, by the way. I mean, all the puppets are great, but like yeah. when I first that was a that bear really drew me to that show. I was like, yeah, that's a great well, puppet. Yeah, he was a great puppet and a great character. Yeah. And um, I remember because what the what would happen was they would all gather around for story time in the show. They were toys in a toy shop. They would all gather around the bear who would tell a story, and then they'd go off and have adventures. And because the bear was the reader. The bear didn't get to go in the story. That was just, it was just so fun. There were these crayons in a box that would basically do the moral of the story. And then the um, bear would read and then we'd go have adventures based on the story. And it dealt with a lot of childhood issues like being afraid of the dark, um, playing well with others, having trouble going to sleep, you know, things like that. Another show that was like that, and you sent me actually pictures of this, uh, was in 1997, mm -hmm. you did a show called Lost on Earth, which I, you know, I was watching TV in 1997, and, and this never came across my radar. But, mm -hmm. well, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about the show and, and how you got on it? But then also, I would love for you to talk about the puppets on that show, because... <laughs> uh, they look like the pictures you sent me. And as a puppeteer, when you see pictures of puppets, you think about, oh, what would it be like to operate that? And every single one of those pictures was like, that looks like a heavy puppet uh. to perform. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so tell me a bit about Lost on Earth. Well, this was actually the show that I got to quit my waiter job from. Again, it was another referral. 
I believe, I could be misquoting this, but I think Christine Papalexis, she knew about the job, but she was doing aliens or something, you know, some little tiny movie. And, <laughs> and um, so she couldn't do it. So she sent me as a woman, you know, there were not at that time, there were not very many women who uh, were auditioning for things. So the audition for that was great for me because as an actor, you learn how to audition. It's part of your training. And so when I go into the room, I knew how to be in the room. You know what I mean? So auditioning for that was fun for me. The only, the, the weird thing about, I hadn't really auditioned for um, very many shows like this. And I got a puppet after Kevin Carlson used it. And it was and I don't know how many people used it before him. It was drenched in sweat. So it was really like, Ugh. sorry, Kev. But uh, I put this really horrible feeling puppet on inside and, you know, read dialogue and made people laugh. And it was hilariously fun. And I got a job as an assistant to Terry Harden, who, um, I don't know. Do you know Terry? I've never met Terry, but I know of Terry. Yes, of course. Terry can talk blue streak. And when you're new in puppetry, I sat there gobbling up every word that came out of her mouth because she is a fountain of lore about puppetry. And she really taught me how to be a good assistant. And um, she is probably at the time, I remember marveling at her physical strength because she doing the main, you know, muscle work on that would have her hand up in the air and I'd be going, my hands are killing me. <laughs> my hands down. And she would just carry on and I would just go, okay, and follow her around. But she was just a pro and strong as the day is long. So we were, a, we were a good team though, because, um, I, we would talk about the acting before we would shoot, you know, what are we doing the moment before the camera rolls, you know, um, that was, it was so fun. And uh, that was my first series. So the, uh, that I was a regular on. So for me, it was kind of a, a, a big deal because it was my first series and Drew. So it was Drew and Drew Massey and Kevin Carlson, Carl Johnson and Terry, Greg Ballora was on it. Sandy Grin. Do you know Sandy Grin? No. Sandy was, he worked for the Crofts a lot. John Lovelady was our puppet liaison. And Carl uh, did the suit. There was a big suit character in it. He did that. Robin Walsh, then Howard, I think. Um, she was our wrangler because Kyoto's built it. So it came from the Kyoto shop. So you can see how there's a theme here. Kyoto's did Lost on Earth. And then I moved on to crayon box which crayon was box. also kyoto's yeah so yeah so you you tend to you you get in this you step in a beehive of people and you get handed on with the same beehive so <laughs> right. sorry is that a bad bad way to put it no it's not as long as you're allergic to bees but um <laughs> i think that's what it's interesting because the kyoto brothers doing both of those shows that's what makes the puppets look unique because <laughs> Um, the Kyoto brothers just have their own style and they just, yeah. do, they just do things their own way. Well, there were some known sitcom directors who directed that. There was a human actors in it. There were many human actors. So the, the premise of the show was that these aliens landed on earth and they were in a storage closet of a, of a TV show. And they thought they were ta taking on a form to blend in on earth. And they took on the form of puppets. I think we shot 13 episodes. I don't even remember. It was so long ago. The puppets were foam latex. You can tell by looking at them, they're, they're in a new, you know, they have that sort of rubbery surface. And um, I think Kev Kevin's character had no arms and there were live, they had live hands. My character was a little complicated because it had live arms and live legs. So there were times where I did both the arms and legs, which was really hard. And it was always a weird, freaky setup. How do you do this? Yeah. And there, I remember trying so many things. One time Terry stuck her arm like between my thighs 
And that was super awkward, but you know, you do what you can. And I was in the couch, this old natty couch where my, my body, my torso was in the back of it. My arms were coming through some, I mean, it was all these weird gyrations to try to get it to work. And, you know, they forget about you that you're in the couch. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, and for me, my first series, I was like, yes, I can do that. Yes. 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 So, you know, where do you need me? I'll be there. And the other thing about that puppet, it had two bodies. It had a body that had pneumatic breasts. The breasts would inflate and the, the base of the body, I think this is this puppet. It had these two little spigot heads where you, they would attach the hoses to inflate the breasts. And that body was so heavy because of the, you know, they had to put the mechanics in it. So even Terry needed to lean that puppet. So she'd lean it on my head and I would feel the little spigots digging into my scalp. <laughs> yes, I can do it. Yes, that's fine. No, it doesn't <laughs> hurt. You know, <laughs> I didn't use that gag too often. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was fascinating. So yes, the puppets, because foam latex itself is not very heavy, but you have to build a structure to support it. When you look at them, you can see they're very cartoony mm -hmm. looking, but they have a, a sort of eerie humanness quality to them. Um, so the structures had to be what they had to be. They had move, you know, mechs in the eyes. There's a lot of mechs going on. Yeah. So they, they were on the heavy side. I'm not going to lie. I was I was watching one clip and I think it was from the first episode. But there's even like there was like one gag where, when the human character first realizes that these puppets are alive, that this one puppet his eyes pop out, but then there's like a million ping pong balls behind oh, yes. his eyes that just come mm -hmm. shooting out. And I know that that was you know probably a special puppet for that shot that was rigged mm -hmm. in a certain way. But yeah, it was it's crazy all the little things that those puppets were doing in that show. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was nutty. How, yeah. you know, how you get, how do you get those puppets to do the things they did? Yeah. And yeah, it was, I mean, I will always be grateful to that show because <laughs> I got to leave the hotel <laughs> and it was my first pair of tall shoes. Yeah. Oh, that's where you got your first pair of tall shoes. Yeah. 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 Do you still have those tall shoes? You or... know, I, they disintegrated. Oh, the rubber kind of finally gave up the ghost and no. so <laughs> well you mentioned earlier when when we were talking about um you know your training and going in and working on the digital puppetry studio uh -huh. and you've done a couple shows uh, with uh, the jim henson company on the digital puppetry studio but uh you i wanted to talk about francis because you did the show francis with them um mm -hmm. and you played francis and it's based on the popular book series um, I think they're, they're badgers, right? Isn't that yeah. what they, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, talk a little bit about that and getting that job. And was that a job you got because you were there every day working on the system and they were like, <laughs> yeah, come on in. Or how did that come about? I got the audition because I was there all yeah. the time. Um, so I was someone who was just on the radar as a woman who knew at least something about using the digital system. So um Actually, this was another magical audition for me because they asked me to come in and read for it. And my son at the time was, I think, like three to four. And the Francis in the stories was four. So um, improv was just like a walk in the park because it was my life. I had this little creature at home who was that badger okay. so it was it was super easy for me to step into that character and to improv on that ca character and that's you know that's another thing about character creation is you want to use everything that's real for you and you know you do enough improv <laughs> if you can use what you know it's the best because it's real yeah and so you know, I could improv for days about being a four year, a four year old, you know, and sitting in the bathtub talking <laughs> about strawberries, you know, and it all makes complete sense. So I remember it was just so fun and so natural. It was um, it was great. And a lot of people I, I heard Karen Prell was coming down to read for I mean, there were like 
monsters in Muppet history yeah. that were reading for it. So it was kind of a, it was an absolute shock. I remember I was in a shopping mall and Brett Nelson called me and he, you know, I picked up my cell phone and he said, we want you to, we want you to be Francis. And I, um, I had to sit down. I was <laughs> so flummoxed. I had to sit down. It was staggering. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So that was, that show meant a lot to me. And um, the scripts were amazing. Um, it was Judy Rothman and Alex Rockwell were the, co I think they co-wrote it or they traded off or whatever, but the scripts were wonderful. They were, you know, it's about toddler learning and how to control your emotions. And they were based on the books and the books are adorable. They're pencil sketches. And in the end, everybody was so supportive and, you know, tried to help me to do my best. And as a new person, it was a lot. It yeah. was a lot at the time. Um, and thankfully, uh, the character was not hard for me because I had that character at home. My kid was at home and he was that right. character. And I think Lisa had her daughter was like a year older than my son at the time. So she knew the character super well too, but that was a crazy time. Would your son say something and then you're like, oh, that's good. I got to write that down for <laughs> <laughs> to say that as Francis. Oh, I used to keep notebooks of stuff he said. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a big step forward for me. Yeah. Uh, the career wise, because that was such uncharted territory in my experience. So I learned a lot, yeah. that's for sure. Well, you you know, a large portion of your work has been uh, like Francis and, and you went on to work on Sid the Science Kid for mm -hmm. um, the Henson Company too. And then, but you've also done work, uh, more adult things. I mean, I think Lost on Earth from the 11 mm -hmm. minutes I watched on thing, I was like, well, this is a 90s adult, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of show. And then, um, you know, you've done work with Crank Yankers, and I think you kind of touched on this before, but do you prefer doing stuff for younger audiences and families, or do you prefer the adult stuff, or does it not matter to you at all? Um, I I enjoy both for different reasons. Like, um, we did um, Good Morning Today, which was another digital show. It, it's fun to do that more adult material, but... Um, I, I really enjoy kid stuff mm -hmm. and I tend to not be blue. That's not my forte. So um, I tend to do more, I guess, I guess I'm on the cleaner side of town. I, I don't, I don't curse very often, <laughs> you know, when I do people listen, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I'm a, a little more uh, G rated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is not a great segue into this, but uh, well, back on episode 66, I talked to your husband, Greg Ballora, uh -huh. about the work you two did on the Netflix series, Ratchet. Ah. And I, I would just love to know your thoughts working on it, because I think it's one of, at least as far as I've seen, one of the darkest and most shocking pieces of puppetry <laughs> that I've ever seen on television. And just in... Um, you know, I, we don't have to get into shot by shot how this works, right. but if anybody listening, I mean, you know, this might be a little bit of um, a, the content might be a little upsetting or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we just want to throw that warning out there if you have not yeah. seen it. But this was really um, I didn't watch the whole series, but I sought out this part when I mm -hmm. talked to Greg and I was like, holy cow, they yeah. they did this with puppets and it deals with, you know, just horrible things. But then, you know, I, anyway, I would love to know your your take on it and your thoughts working on it because um you know it's there's nothing else like it puppetry wise at least that i've seen <laughs> well okay so i guess the the whole the shocking part of it is that the ratchet character played by sarah paulson the backstory is that she was in foster homes and she was abused and there are there's a lot of physical stuff in it and what you see in the series is a fraction of what we shot because there were multiple parental scenes where she had moved from foster home to foster home where there was abuse. 
reading the script, it was like, oh my gosh, when you get a script like that and you know that you could potentially be working on something like that, you want to do it because it's, it's not every day you get an opportunity to do something like that. And um, Jessica Yu, who is the director, she had worked with Greg before, um, which is how, why she called him to, we built the puppets in our shop and uh, Carol Binion costumed them. Her costumes were amazing. She was in charge of it. There were a lot of characters and Rick Lazzarini, he molded the heads and the, he, he, we did original sculpts and he molded, I think he had sculptors who did the heads and the feet and he did all the, the painting. Um, but first of all, marionettes are, you know, they are not as specific as doing a hand puppet. Uh, so you have to figure out what you're going to do. And to do these beating scenes was it was quite a feat to figure out how to do that. We had Adrian Rose Leonard and Tim Blaney and Christine Papalexis marionetting because, you know, you marionette people specifically, you want to get the, the right people to do that because there's a lot of finesse involved. And I ended up getting handed, <laughs> well, I ended up doing the Mildred character, which is the Sarah Paulson character. And um, we had to, Re there were child actors that did part of the scene and then the real ugly parts of the scene we did with the puppets. And it was hard to get, you know, one puppet to hit with a, with a, a fire iron, you know, hit the other puppet and have them splat on the floor in the right way. And we did a thousand takes and, you know, as the puppeteer, you don't have any control over what take they take, uh -huh. you know? So they take what they take and you watch it later on. You go, Oh, wait, my leg is levitating in that shot and <laughs> you don't have control it, but whatever we would go through the dialogue. And I noticed when I watched the, the actual show, they actually left my voice in for part of it, which they weren't supposed to do. They were, the, I think the kid was looping it and it was, you know, she gets hit and she's on the floor. Going, no! <laughs> you know, there's all this crying and, you know, running away and, you know, it, it very dramatic. Yeah. And you do the dialogue and you go through those scripts. And there's one, there was one scene where um, Greg's, Greg played the adoptive brother, the evil brother. And he, well, he was, you know, an abused kid. He was sneaking into the bedroom with a knife and stabbing one of the foster parents with a knife. And Rick Lazzarini rigged this beautiful thing where, blood would come out of the eyes and it was little rolled up pieces of, I don't know if it was ribbon or paper, or what it was, but he was underneath the stage pulling these ribbons with string so that the puppet would turn towards the camera and these little things would unfurl oh. and the blood would come out. And it was just such a great use of puppetry to do that rather yeah. than show the gore. You know, it was creepy enough with puppets rather than, you know, just, and you would see Greg's little character coming in the door with a knife up like an ax murderer. And it was like, it was crazy. Yeah. And we, we had some magnetic props where he would pick the knife up. The puppet had an, I think it was magnet in the hand and he'd pick up the knife and do a part of the take that way. So you'd see him get the knife and creep up this. It was really, it's so fun to get to do a real, dramatic piece like that yeah it's not you don't do that every day that's not a, yeah. a daily diet but <laughs> it's so fun to get to create that world and some of it like what rick had done with the blood it's representational but so effective and creepy and you just kind of go oh you know yeah there was there was a scene where the the brother and sister character were basically asked to do horrible things to one another and the two kids are standing there in pajamas and we had somebody hold the feet on the stage i don't remember who it was but somebody hold, held the feet down so that we could make the puppets tremble and it was just like oh you watch that the trembling yeah. and you know the things that go into the magic of making that happen 
you know, you're doing technical stuff. So you're not, you know, having a heart attack while you're doing it because you're, you know, you're buried in the technical of it. Yeah. But yeah. What a, what a gift that one was. Well, and then you, you two got like a little cameo in there too, because. Oh uh, yeah. This is. It was funny because it's a faraway shot. Uh-huh. And I told Greg the same thing. But yeah. as soon as that little door opened, I was like, oh, that's Greg and Kristen right there. <laughs> like, I can tell that's, that's, that's them. Well, what was funny was Greg, you know, he submitted all the pictures of the puppeteers to the casting so that they could pick who they wanted to be in the window. And he put his picture at the top and mine at the bottom so that it wouldn't be like a natural, oh, we'll take these two, right? And we used our, I use my maiden name when I work. That was a whole thing. Greg and I used to not tell people we were, a couple, just in case, you know, in case they don't want to hire a couple. Yeah. And so, but they picked us anyway to be the two on camera people, which was hilarious. And they dressed us in period uh, costume. So, and they gave me hose and heels and I'm climbing <laughs> up and down the scaffolding. And, you know, while I'm puppeteering the hair guys down below going, I got to fix your rollers. And I was like, <laughs> no, I got to get the shot. So it was this crazy, it was this crazy thing being in full period. And just the thought that people puppeteered wearing those clothes, you know, you know, yeah. we we're busy wearing our t-shirts and our, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pockety pants and, you know, comfortable. Yeah. So, and Greg had to shave his beard and he looked a little like Walt Disney. <laughs> You know, with his little tiny pencil mustache and stuff. It was, that was fun. It was really fun to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. certainly, I mean, it's, I said, you know, it, the content uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, just another warning is, is not, you know, if, if you're easily upset by things like that, but watching it, you're just like, holy cow, they did this with puppets. And it's, it's really yeah. an amazing piece. And I, you know, I don't know what's going on with that show, but I think people definitely need to find that episode and, and mm-hmm. check it out because it's, it's worth seeing that part. When we, when there's a director who really says, Hey, I can do this with puppets. That is such a gift to all of us because it's so fun to do that. And to have a director who has faith that this is going to communicate the thing is it's just a gift, you know? So that was super fun. And if you blink, you'll miss us (laughs) popping out because literally it's a blink when you see us. But it's yeah, it's it's good though. It's good. People yeah. should definitely check it out if they can, if they yeah. can take it. Um, another recent show that you worked on is uh, Duff's Happy Fun Bake Time, uh, um, where it was a, a Henson show for the for the Food Network, where you played uh, Couscous, um, and this was a really unique puppet um, because the mm-hmm. rig was a little unique, and just because I know that you also played an alien, I think um, mm-hmm. it was either because I I worked I think two days on it, and you were either doing. Uh, the alien or the eggs, the Nona eggs. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I got to use this couscous rig, but can you talk a little bit about this rig? Cause it was okay. really, really, really fun. And it's a fun puppet too. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, the puppet couscous was really Donna voiced it and right. did the um, remote control on the face. Right. And um, I did the, the, f- the physical puppetry uh, on set and Duff Goldman is such a treat literally to work with he's just so fun and i was under his arm pretty much all day every day so because couscous is the sous chef i learned so much about cooking and baking <laughs> from him i'd say hey Duff, how do you blah blah and he would tell me how to do those things but um so what happened was uh you know it was during covid so donna we we kind of worked in pods you know, uh, Donna and I were partners and um, Dorian and Kenny were partners. Victor and Amanda were partners, Amanda Maddock and Victor Yared, uh, Dorian Davies and Kenny Stevenson, her husband. Um, I just want to be clear who those people are. <laughs> Donna, I was going to go look at the puppet because I knew I was manipulating the body of that puppet. So I went to the creature shop and I put the puppet on and it's, you know, it's a robot. So it's made of fiberglass, there's metal, there's, it's a very heavy puppet. So I put the puppet on and I could do it with my arm absolutely straight over my head so that I could, you know, balance myself underneath. But if I try, went off the axis at all, if I went off center, I would be crippled. We talked about, 
mounting it somehow. And they said, well, we can, you know, maybe put a steady cam arm like they did. Michael Ostrom's character on Earth to Ned had a cart of some sort with an assist or a backpack or something with an assist. Mm -hmm. So they put a steady cam arm on this cart to help take some of the weight of this puppet. There's a crossbar inside it that you grab to move the head, to do the gross head movement. And it was at a weird, I had to change the angle. So, you know, basically what I like to do, I go in the shop and I say, is it possible to do this? And I, we talk about what is possible, you know, cause they're building and they have, you know, their budget's done. And what can we do to make this a little more ergonomic for the puppeteer? So the Scott Johnson and um, all the shop guys, they were wonderful and made that puppet puppeteerable for me because I'm not a giant person and it, it was a heavy puppet. So I had this cart that was on a, the puppet was on a steady cam arm so that it would take a lot of the weight for me. And you had to, you had to really manage the size of the footprint because with the cart, it's a big footprint. So you have to figure out your choreography to make a cross. Everything is a, you know, is a choreography thing. But the other thing was that it had hands that were static and the puppet had to do a lot. Like I had to take trays of food and put it in the oven. And I, the one, <laughs> I got those little claws to hang wet pasta on a drying rack. <laughs> and that was, I was so proud of myself for doing that because it was this whole finessing of how do you use the static claw and get it to pick something up and put something down. So, you know, that's our, but that's what we're there for is to figure out how to make that magical thing happen. And of course we had Andrea Detweiler as the head wrangler there and she, and Wolfgang. Yeah, Wolfgang Criswell. Yeah, they took care of me so well. They, you know, I'd say, hey, I needed to do this. Can, can we put a rod over here? And can we get another rod on the bottom? I can do it if you can do, and they would just, come up with whatever I needed to achieve what we needed to do. Because, you know, when you're doing a cooking show, there's a lot of props and a lot of, you know, there's stirring and sprinkling and wiping down. And how do you get that stuff to happen in the kitchen? So, and Duff was such a good sport. You know, I'd say, hey, Duff, I can do this if you can do that with me. And he'd go, sure, tell me what to do. You know, he was such a great guy to, you know, he really wanted to understand what we needed from him to get the best thing. And he would, you know, wear these crazy costumes and carry stuff and push stuff. And, you know, he was great. So um, again, it was another example of all of these people being generous and supportive and to make something really fun. So that was a it was a really great experience and the puppet was heavy, but we figured out how to make it work and, uh, and how to make it really do some things we never expected it to be able to do. Did you see the robot version of it when you were there? I don't think I did because it was, it wasn't that shot, but I, I watched a couple of clips before this interview and I mm -hmm. think I saw it in one of the clips with the rolling pin feet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was really, yeah. I was like, well, I, I would have loved to have seen that while I yeah. was there. Yeah. They built a full robot. Yeah. And it had, uh, it had a rolling pin on the bottom and she had all these tools, like a tool belt with all these kitchen utensils that she could, you know, supposedly attach to her hands and, you know, because yeah. there was originally a thing they were going to have it roll on the counter, but then how does it get up on the counter? And so, but it was cool. It's a really great puppet, um, and and mm -hmm. I'm not taking anything away from the other puppets that are on the on that show. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that puppet and you see the little clips, I don't know. There's just something about it, just the way it's built, the way it, it mm -hmm. moves, the way uh, you know it, you guys made it work. Uh, it really catches your eye, and and um, mm -hmm. it was fun to watch you guys work on that. Um, it was, was really there. great fun to do, and of course, Donna's a really a very dear friend of mine. I find it so easy to work with her because I. You know, we've known each other. Our kids are the same age. You know, our kids yeah. are a year and a half apart. So I get a feeling about what Donna's going to do. And right. so it's always a joy to work with her. And she was also puppet captain on that. And she was amazing. It, it just was a really fun, super fun job to do.
Yeah. And uh, the puppet, that puppet, it's, you know, it is a robot and it's fun to have a robot, you know? Yeah. And that's also, I mean, not to take anything away from the other puppets. I just, uh, having an actual robot as a puppet is really fun. Yeah. You're also a prolific builder who's built a lot of puppets as well. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, you have a shop at the house. Um, I'm wondering, what is the most complicated puppet that you've ever had to build? Oh, well, the most complicated puppets, usually there's a team of us doing it. It's not just me. Right. So two puppets are pretty complicated. One was um, Iago for Disneyland. Uh, Greg... um, Christine and I worked on this puppet. I mean, I, I really did just finishing details. It was more Christine and Greg, but the other puppet that I, that is complicated that I do a lot on are Mr. World. Have you seen these commercials? Yes. Yeah. I've seen clips of like, you know, when you, when you guys have worked on it and you post pictures and stuff. Yeah. It's eyeglass world and their mascot is a puppet with a, the head is a world. It looks like a little earth and um, Paul McGinnis does the voice and puppeteers the head of that. And Christine and Greg do puppeteer the body. We, every time we we've, I think we're in our fifth year of doing them and Tobin Seymour directs all of them. We usually build, I think like eight heads and usually we do a full body and a, a puppet a hand puppet body for every spot. We usually shoot three locations. So there'll be three bodies, depending on how many costume changes there are and how fast those changes need to be will determine the number of bodies we're building. So for one character, we're building a lot every time we do it. And because it's commercials, the puppet needs to be absolutely pristine every time we shoot it. So we re- we build them fresh every year. And Greg also built a fully animatronic version, which, you know, he builds the animatronic. I do, uh, Christine will do foam work. I'll do foam work. We do, I mean, we all do so many different things. Um, Alison Mork does all of the continents that are on his face. That's, you know, we all have our specialty at this point, because we've been doing it for so many years, that puppet becomes complicated also because every year they dream up some other zany thing that Mr. World can do. He's been a bull rider. He's been a, an astronaut. Um, He has zip lined. He's been a diver. We actually jammed the puppet in water. (laughs) So there was an underwater camera that shot those. That puppet does a lot. Yeah. So it's really, we wait every year to see what Tobin gets the ad company to agree to. And we keep saying, I did a rod. I did a rod. <laughs> you know, to see what what is the puppet going to do this year. And every time he has a costume change, he changes his glasses. So this is the whole thing of Mr. World sports all these pairs of glasses that's what he's a glasses prop but he is a very complicated glasses prop well yeah i always love when you when you um you know because uh, i follow all of you on social media and all that stuff Uh but like after you shoot i go oh here come the mr world pictures what (laughs) crazy things you know have they have they done with uh, mr world this year yeah yeah and i allison and i wrangle on that job and um i I can't rem- I think it was the motorcycle job. It's so funny the things you learn doing this. Um, something happened. Uh, again, Carol Binion did the costumes and she makes these gorgeous just out tuxedos and capes and leather jackets and I mean just these impeccable costumes and I forgot the extra leather jacket for the motorcycle rider and we were in we were on a process trailer. Oh, so it was like, oh no. And our um, uh, first AD, Marius, he he looked at me with these stern eyes. Why don't I have the leather jacket? So I call, you know, who I, I don't know if it was Allison at the table. You got to meet me in the woods. And I'm running through the woods <laughs> to get the leather jacket to the process. You know, it's a crazy thing, but 
you know, you jump in and you, Woo, let's do it. One of my favorite things was when he was a conductor, because we, we've gotten to a point now where we rehearse in our backyard. They put a little stage in the backyard so that we can send clips to the, to the client. And Greg was doing the conductor's hands. And we blast this classical music in the backyard and he'd be conducting like mad back there. So he could send it up. So fun. Yeah. Just really fun stuff. As we wrap up here, I would love to know what is exciting you in the world of puppetry these days? I'm, I'm doing a wood carving class right now. Okay. I signed up for a class with Berndt Grodnik. He lives in Iceland and it's the first time I've actually really worked with wood because, you know, I make foam and fabric and, you know, wood has always just been an inner structure, but I'm actually carving wood puppets right now. And it has been such a, just an amazing journey doing this. And he, it's like learning to carve wooden puppets from Geppetto. He's an absolute master yeah. at carving and it's just been a fabulous experience and it it informs all the other types of building that i do because you don't have to just build wood puppets you can add it as part of your arsenal to build other things that you build but it's um yeah, that's been so amazing to do i highly recommend it and he's on facebook you can look him up and he's always doing um a new course or a class or something. And he's, he's adorable. It's so much fun. Yeah. So. His work is, I think I, I, one of the online O'Neill's, I think maybe at the, when the first year of our pandemic, I, I think when they did it all online, I think he gave a talk and I had never heard of him, but like him mm -hmm. showing all his work was just blowing my mind. It's, yeah, he's really great. Yeah. He's quite, he's a solo artist. And you know, the thing is that solo artists like, Berndt and like Ronnie Burkett, if you don't get to see their shows, you may miss them yeah. because they do live shows and they are solo performers. So you may not meet them in the normal channels of meeting people. And they are artists that these guys are artists that you don't want to miss in your career if you are a puppeteer. What has been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? <laughs> can't just have one well you can have two i'll give you two no I, you can have as no. many as you i want, mean but. i've talked about a lot of them you know doing doing francis was a big deal crayon box was a big deal for me i mean these i don't think i have one thing because each you know each show has its own uniqueness and its own and i end up with all these great stories because of them i don't i don't think i have a highlight really well, your whole career is a highlight then. You know what? I have a pretty fun life. So yeah. that's my highlight. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Grant. It was really fun. Many thanks to Kristen Charney for being on the show. For links to some of the things we discussed, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 72, over at underthepuppet.com. And if you'd like to hear even more of my talk with Kristen, download the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android and click on the gift icon in the listing for this episode. Now it's time to announce the winner of episode 71's giveaway for a custom puppet video from All Felt No Filter. The question was, how many years did Troy Murphy's nightclub show run for? And the answer was, two years. And the winner is Kevin Meister. Congratulations, Kevin. Info on how to claim your personalized puppet video is on the way. Once again, I'd like to thank Troy Murphy of AllFeltNoFilter.com for donating the prize for last episode. This episode, we're giving away a brand new copy of the book, Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal Bestiary. This hardcover picture book is the definitive guide to the creatures of Thra and features illustrations of creatures from both the film and the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance TV show. To be entered to win a copy of The Dark Crystal Bestiary, all you have to do is answer this question from the episode you just heard. Who gave Kristen Charney a tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop after she wrote him a letter? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. 
All entries for this giveaway must be received by June 15th, 2022. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the July 2022 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I want to send a special thank you out to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who help make this show possible. Patreon patrons at the producer level and above who get a little special shout out are Vicki Sebring, David Akers, Tony Urbano, Kathy Crawford, Eve Cunning, and Dorothy Bachoco. To become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604. Or you can click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your comments and feedback via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com, or you can connect with the show on Instagram or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staver and featured music by Dan Rank. Help spread the word about the show by sharing your favorite Under the Puppet episode with a friend. Under the Puppet is copyright 2022 Saturday Morning Media, Grandpa Choco Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents the adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.